it. So we are live uh, today. I'm with Anil. Anil, uh, thanks for being on, uh, you know, Bitcoin Stories. Thanks for uh, having me, Sonny. Really uh, excited to chat to you and a big fan for what you stand for. Nice, nice. So we, I mean, we kind of touched on it before I hit record, but usually I start with Anil, like where our paths had, you know, first cro- crossed. Um, so I, I think you said you don't maybe remember exactly, but do you, do you know approximately when we met? Like it was what, like three, four years ago, maybe at, at a Toronto event? I, I want to say um, somewhere in the range of 20, 20- 14 to 2016. Hey, yeah, it's good um, enough range. Yeah, and I, I again, I couldn't pin down what city, which maybe also speaks a bit to uh, how crowded <laughs> the conference schedule gets during yeah. certain cycles. So, yeah, yeah, I honestly, I, I couldn't pin it down, but I, I do vividly Around remember there. meeting you because you're a very uh, eloquent public speaker. You managed to fit a lot of uh, hard concepts to explain into you know a very short time frame oh well that's really great i love i love when people uh you know say something positive about all this stuff because quite frankly i don't know why i do what i do half the time so (laughs) to to know that it helps someone somewhere uh is is always nice um so as i was saying one of my kind of you know if you, I'm an engineer, I'm an entrepreneur, but if you look at like Bitcoin, it's just like ones and zeros, right? Floating around. Um, it's really a function of the, like kind of the stories behind it, right? And and those stories aren't behind ones and zeros, they're behind the people. And so I am kind of addicted now where I was releasing one like hour and a half long video, but today I might release three just because I'm like loving this, uh, where I just try and capture people's stories. And and the first question is really, what's your story? And I I don't know if this resonates with you, but to me, I think Bitcoin is like, when I learned about Bitcoin, it was like a singularity event. It was like, like whether you think of it mathematically or whether you think about like the technological thing, it's like this life changing event for many people, or at least most people that I talk to. And And so what did your life look like, you know, your story, I guess, prior to learning about Bitcoin and then, you know, maybe post Bitcoin? Yeah, that's a a great question. Uh, Before Bitcoin, and I know a lot of people have these sort of come to moments where once you do put in the time and really understand what this represents is there is that fundamental shift in how you behave and the incentives around your your life. So I I would say after post uh, Bitcoin, um, I guess I lowered my time preference. I started to look more at things from, you know, first principles or foundational level knowledge. And it really helped me slow down and go deeper in, in pretty much everything that that I do. So uh, it <laughs> don't want to sound evangelical, but that Bitcoin really did, you know, change the course um, of my life for the better. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So what did your life look like, I guess? Like, are you, uh, you know, and by the way, Eden, I don't know if you've heard of Sovereign, uh, but he, because usually it's like, I jokingly say some people start with their parents, some people talk about their first job, and he literally went back like three generations or something and <laughs> talked about like, well, you know, <laughs> World War Two and like, oh my God, like the crazy stories. But anyway, so up to you, yeah. wherever you want to pick it yeah. up, it could be, uh, but but where does your story begin for you? Uh I would actually say it was probably when I was about 13 or 14 uh, in high school. And I used to uh, go to a fairly competitive high school and I would spend, you know, a good chunk of my weekends studying, unfortunately. And I'd always have the radio on. And during that time, there would always be these contests, you know, hey, win concert tickets to, uh, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, be caller number five, what have you. And just because I was always at home studying on a weekend, um, I would always call in to try and win these radio competitions. And over time, I started to game that system a bit. Uh, you know, we were an early household to maybe get a, you know a dial-up internet connection, so we had two phone lines. And then one of my parents were pretty early in getting a cell phone, so 
all of a sudden I had access to multiple phone lines to call in to these radio stations mm-hmm. and I was able to uh, consistently win concert tickets. And I know, <laughs> I promise this is going somewhere. Um, and because I was pretty young and I was winning tickets to shows that I would never want to go to, you know, like Rod Stewart or uh, Dolly Parton, I would often um, sell these tickets. So uh, I just by chance became a ticket scalper as a teenager. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and that helped me, I guess, I, you, know, you have to learn a bit about markets. There's demand, there's supply, how many tickets are available, how many shows are happening. Uh, and I got pretty good at it to the point where in high school, I would actually pay classmates to skip school to then go line up at the box office for me. And um, yeah, that was probably where I kind of first understood digital scarcity because this was when the shift happened from physical box office to uh, online ticketing. And I think it's a decent analogy because if you think of a live concert, you've got a fixed number of seats. There's only a certain number of people getting in there. Uh, you can transfer tickets digitally. So you, could, you, know, you can pass them around. And for me, um, when I first heard about Bitcoin, as weird as it sounds, I felt like the barrier to understanding a digitally scarce good, it wasn't such a leap for me because I felt I'd already dealt with that. Hmm. So in a weird way, I think that's kind of what helped me get it a little bit uh, sooner than than otherwise. Interesting, interesting. Wow, that, that goes far back. You remember your first computer? (laughs) <laughs> uh i do actually my, my dad was always tinkering yeah um was he like a technical guy or was he just, no, just have a hobby he was actually a, a graphic designer so we just always had cool uh you know cool tools around the home whether it was like cutters or laser jet printers um, or what have you so he's he's just always been tinkering his whole life so it was kind of cool to, you, you always have your hands on some sort of toy that eventually becomes mainstream. Hey, Neil, a question for you. Uh, I, I got to ask, is there a reason you have a, a poster be, or a picture of a map behind you that says Kolkata on it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, my, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, talking to you from, from Canada and uh, I have a pretty scattered background. Grew up in the UK, um, or sorry, I was born in the UK, grew up in Australia. Hmm. now live in Canada uh, and obviously I'm Indian so my wife actually bought me these maps as a way to uh, not feel so uh, homesick I guess but uh, yeah my, my uh, grandfather lives in Kolkata and uh, used to go there as a kid. Interesting. Do you, do you speak Bengali? I, I do not I do not my parents intentionally did not teach me so they could <laughs> communicate themselves uh, without me knowing. Are you serious? No, you're yeah, joking. Uh, 100%, 100%. <laughs> it was their yep. secret language. That's awesome. Exactly. My exactly, wife and yeah. kids have done the same thing because my wife's from oh, yeah. Colombia and she speaks okay. Spanish. And my kids, surprisingly, even though they're only three and six, speak like fluent Spanish. And I'm yep. kind of left out. out it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my parents are from India and they're from Calcutta yeah. as well. That's why I ask. And okay. I was the opposite. I, cool. I was. I guess you could say forced to learn Bengali. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was because yeah. of my grandparents. They would visit us regularly. And the only way I could talk to them was if, uh, you know, if I spoke Bengali. But interesting, interesting. So you but have- that's, mm. that's a very cool point though, is that you were forced to speak a certain language in order to communicate with this particular group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for you, they- <laughs> back. But cool, have you been? So you, you've been, you said you visited before? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah, cool. several times, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So anyway, so back to your story, uh, uh, you, you, okay. So you're like 13, 14, seems like you're fairly entrepreneurial, yep. maybe a bit tech sav- savvier than maybe your peers. Yeah. It was and, yeah, to, to and well-traveled. Of... It sounds like you've kind of been all over the world, uh, you know, and, uh, and I find these are threads, right? Like I find, like, I don't know, I find a lot of people, they kind of, you know, go through a process and I find like one of the things is just, you know, to kind of get Bitcoin is you got to break yourself out of the, 
money myth and and the whole like the yeah. you know and just just to be able to step back even on a plane and be able to see everything sometimes helps i don't know what it is but Absolutely. but cool but cool but how what is your story where does your story take you next um so i guess to to, to wrap up that one it really goes back to uh creative destruction hmm. really because i was i was a young kid and here's a market, this, this kind of secondary ticket scalping market dominated mm. by uh, an older crew who would go to physical concert venues, stand outside. And, you know, it was a, basically a, a live market um, between buyers and sellers each night that there was a concert. Mm. And then that kind of almost overnight moved online. And I was fortunate that I was there at that time and kind of understood how to navigate a, you know, a website. Uh, so I got to kind of see, okay, here's, here's just a very obvious shift of going from the physical world to the digital world and we're not going back. And then you kind of just keep seeing that same evolution play out across various markets and industries um, just continually. And um, yeah, as I said, you know, I've lived in a, a few different countries and traveled a fair bit and uh, uh, studied in quite a few different countries. And if you've ever had to open a bank account in a new country where you're on a visa, you know what a joy that is. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. Like you just said, um, you know, when, impossible. <laughs> when you, you travel a lot, you understand where the friction is mm. um, and the use case maybe just becomes more, more obvious. Hmm. Interesting. Cool. And then, and then I guess what, yeah, what happens next for you? Uh, so I, I go to work in the music industry itself. Really? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Not as a ticket scalper, but just there were so many changes happening very rapidly, mm. uh, especially around the economics of the uh, live entertainment industry. So CD sales, obviously, straight down. Mm. And <clears throat> artists now have to make a living touring or selling the rights to their, uh, their work. Mm. So that was a, a cool point in time to see that that shift take place. And what and was then, your viewpoint into the music world? So just understanding maybe a bit about the economics of how uh, ticketing worked in practice. But were you, let's try, I'm just curious, like, were you, uh, like, what, what, like, did you work in a company there at some company or was it yeah, more so, like your, uh, like a pet project? Did you build something there? Or? So I actually... Um, you don't have to name them, by the way, if you're not comfortable with <laughs> Well, so I remember I was in my undergrad at the university mm. and um, actually I'll, I'll jump back a, a sec. I, yeah, this please is really do. Embarrassing, but I oh, love, especially if it's embarrassing. It's, it's, it's horrific <laughs> how bad this is. But <laughs> as a child, I don't know yeah. if you know the band Limp Bizkit. I do. I, I loved, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Huge Limp Bizkit fan. And they, I remember them coming to Australia to do a tour and I begged my parents to let me go. And they said, no, it's too dangerous. You'll do something stupid. Uh, sorry. I was furious. Next day, wake up, see the newspaper. And the concert I wanted to go to, a young girl about the same age as me got crushed to death in the mosh pit. So horrific. Thinking, how can this happen in, uh, in a developed city with all these safety standards and procedures? Uh, it just blew my mind. So I ended up... Um, really going down that rabbit hole of um, event management and how do you put on large scale events um, and especially around the security and safety of these events. So I went into the music industry through that angle of, cool. you know, hmm. of security. Uh, and that was really cool because I got to, you know, travel a lot, work on pretty big shows. Interesting. Um, and coming back to the money piece, yeah, there would often be cases because I would always be part of maybe the security contingent of a large music festival or, you know, stadium tour is at the end of the night, you'd be sitting around sometimes and there'd just be these bags of money that, you know, the bank doesn't open till the next morning. Uh, there's no armored vehicles coming to to pick it up. Sometimes it would be, okay, we're taking backpacks full of cash on behalf of the promoters, uh, you know, and we're responsible for it until the next morning. And, you know, so you can deposit it. So there were just, yeah, it, it just seemed ridiculous to me that in this day and age, everyone at the event has a mobile phone. There has to be an easier solution. Um, you know, point of sale terminals were still kind of 
just working their way in, but sometimes they'd be, uh, you know, too expensive or too cumbersome or a network would go down. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. And then, uh, and then where, so you're like uh, kind of in the music industry, uh, you have these like touch points with money curious, like, did you, like, did you, uh, like what's been your relationship with money? Like, has it always been kind of like, uh, you know, don't need to worry about it. Like, I mean, I know for me, like my parents always yep. like provided whatever we wanted. We had, like, we never got allowances. So money was a really foreign subject when I finally became an adult. It was like, it was like, like, it was like girls. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, but for you, like, I don't know, is it something that you had some familiarity with? Was it more? Yeah, um, I, I would say so. I had, a, I had a job at a very young age um, that, you know, I, I, I don't know what the legal working age limit was, but I almost had to like hide it from my parents because I just, I wanted to work. I wanted to earn an income. I wanted to like, you know, understand how businesses operate. So I was quite fortunate that, you know, from a young age, I was always curious about money um, or about, you know, what determines value. So yeah, it was never something I consciously worried about, but was always curious about why, you know, why does business A uh, do so much better than business B if they sell the same product and they operate in a similar market? Um, yeah, I guess I was always curious about incentives. Mm. Um, and, and you said Bitcoin first, you said came across your radar like way back when, right? And, and was it on your first kind of glance that you took it seriously? Or was it like most others where it took a few stabs at it before you, before it really captured your, yeah. your interest? And, and do you remember when it, like, when you kind of were like, oh my God, this is like yeah, a thing. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do remember the moment when I first heard about it from a family friend and it did kind of shake me to my core of, oh, well, this seems like very obvious. But as many people do, and as I am, um, you know, guilty of, is uh, a, a, there was a small price appreciation in it, and I thought, oh, I've missed the boat, and I put it on a shelf for uh, a couple of years. Mm. So it wasn't until interesting um, I ended up uh, moving to Canada to go back to to go to business school, and it just so happened that the world's first Bitcoin ATM got plunked right down. Uh, equidistance between my business school and my home so i would literally have to walk past this coffee shop anthony and oh coffee mm. shop oh, wait which one was uh, this so it's, wait, which, wait, where are you uh, now are you in, in Toronto? Van in vancouver said? oh in vancouver yeah. right i'd heard about this one okay so which one was this sir or where uh, whereabouts uh, so it's right 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 downtown at, a, at a, a coffee shop a pretty popular brand interesting interesting um, and so it was just always kind of not in my face but it was just kind of growing up, always tinkering with new toys. Uh, this just seemed like something to, to tinker with or, you know, try and understand how it worked. Not from like a, you know, uh, get rich kind of angle, just more, uh, this could play a significant role in the future. It might not. Either way, I'm sure, you know, it's, it's not going to do me a disservice by taking some time to, to, to see what this is. Interesting. Okay. So that's cool. I, yeah, I, yeah. ATMs are, I have an interesting relationship with them too. I, 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 but for me, it was more from like the lens of Toronto mostly. Cause I, I saw uh decentral right. Anthony Diorio oh, yeah, kind yeah. of uh, spearhead a lot of that innovation and bringing in, you know, I don't know if you've heard of bit access. Those were also Canadian guys. Yeah. And, and so uh, that was really cool. Like to really kind of see and feel like I know one of my first experiences was also messing around with Bitcoin mining and, yep. Um, you know, whether it's ATMs, like I like when, you know, cold card, oh my God, oh, these guys I'm, I'm yeah. crazy about. And so when, uh, when Bitcoin turns real, like it turns like into hardware, I just, I love that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, so it's interesting. So what do you do? So you're, you're close to an ATM machine, probably like a lot, like a lot of people today, right? I know in downtown Toronto, we moved out, but there was like, I don't know, four or five machines within like a five minute walking yeah. distance. It just makes me so happy. Canada every was time really... I see a new machine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're getting mm -hmm. so much, uh, easier to use and user friendly and mm -hmm. i think for a lot of people to see something physical um it, it really helps them uh conceptualize bitcoin yeah, if you're yeah, coming yeah, at yeah, it yeah. from from you know zero knowledge prior mm. so yeah yeah canada was really 
has really been uh, on the forefront of, of um, Bitcoin ATMs. So, you know, as I was saying, uh, and, you know, one of my goals mm. with this show is, is that like, even though I, you know, I started India, one of the India's first Bitcoin yeah. uh, platforms, or whatever, um, to me, like price is less relevant. Like, I mean, I love the NGU and the memes and all that, but yep. the thing that really excites me about Bitcoin is that, um, you know, that, that, that price is really not even in the code base like that just it's just yep. literally a function of the free market um but what's what's fascinating to me is is like like i said is people uh like you and others who choose to do things within the ecosystem right to express their art or build companies or whatever it may be right and so hence i'm, I'm kind of naming this building on bitcoin or bitcoin stories or whatever but curious so what does what your story look like in in terms of you know like how do you how do you like you know go from just okay there's a cute little machine at the corner of the street to now being like okay i want to do something here several years of just chipping away at it um Mm. It was just something that always had made me feel kind of insecure and pretty dumb. So the more I could understand about this uh, technology, the less intimidating it would become. Uh, so, you know, when I, when I first stumbled upon Bitcoin, I, I didn't know what a hash function was. I, I, I had never, uh, you know, had much interaction with, you know, cryptographically secured communications or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you, piece by piece, you slowly... Uh, put together your own map of mm. what this means to you and maybe a product of having lived in many different countries and had mm. uh, a lot of friction moving value around with, mm. with payments and, and running a, a, a business as a teenager. You know, I was a lot of the time dealing with uh, physical money orders or paper checks or, or cash, mm. you know. Um, so a way to kind of digitally store value that uh you know was was permissionless borderless uh it just just seemed like a pretty obvious direction um and i know that comes with a lot of baggage i know you you've spent a lot of time and effort fighting to make that true for a lot of people mm. so yeah it uh it, it just it seemed like other people who maybe hadn't had the opportunities to see um our global financial system and how value moves around from multiple different viewpoints could benefit from that. So, mm. hey, so as I was saying, so one, so my first kind of story is more like around your story, and then second is around you know a project that you're you're passionate about or that you're kind of focusing a lot of time or energy on. Um, so I recently came across uh, you again because of a. I think you're writing a book, are you not? Yeah, you've written a book uh, rather. Sorry. Uh, I Sunny, I love Twitter so much. I know there's a lot of. Um, fierce debate going on at the moment, but as a tool, it's, um, it's so uh, helpful to kind of guide you or your actions of what, you know, to kind of get that instant feedback. Mm. Uh, so I've just been putting out, you know, a lot of content for um, maybe a couple of years now, specifically around Bitcoin and, and, and educating people as to maybe what it is or how to think about it, uh, of, you know, different aspects to how it, the mechanics of it. And every now and then someone would say, hey, do you have a, uh, uh, a website or do you have a book? Uh, and then the do you have a book question just kept coming up more and more and more. And it got to a point where I just thought, hey, I just need to start throwing all of these threads, infographics um, into one document for people. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I'm spending my time on now is, uh, is, is writing a, a book to kind of help explain Bitcoin and more of a focus on, you know, how to explain it visually. And before we just get into the story behind that, was there anything else you wanted to share in terms of your story itself? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I guess one thing um, that I just seemed very obvious to me as well is after going to um, business school, the, the subject that made the least sense to me was economics mm. um, and specifically, I guess, Keynesian economics, because that's mm. what is taught at, uh, at business schools here in Canada. And um, after that, I went to work for the, uh, the business school as a MBA um, in admissions and, and as a recruiter. So I'd get to travel around to lots of different countries, uh, quite a, you know, a fair bit of time in Latin America. And it just seemed that there was this undercurrent of very smart, competent people gravitating towards this space. 
Um, and because I would do, you know, hundreds and hundreds of interviews with very alpha type personalities who were very ambitious, uh, it, it was pretty easy to spot that a lot of the most ambitious builders were going into this space. They were shunning traditional, um, you know, top tier names or brands in, uh, in favor of, of, of Bitcoin. So that was just a, a pretty clear signal for me as well. And at this time, when you're about to like shift gears, like are you, you're not in the music industry. You said you're, you're, are no, you in a different industry? So what, what kind of industries sorry, have I, you been a part of? So, so really just the, the, uh, the music industry. And then when I kind of thought, oh, it's time for a, a, a sea change, moved to Canada, go to business school, then work for the business school. So I guess I'm, I'm in education mm, uh, cool. and then shifted out of it. Okay. And then, so what does that look like? Like, how did you, uh, how did you make that move? Because that is, like I said, kind of the essence of why I'm even doing what I'm doing, because I, I want to capture what people, how people make those, those decisions and really to inspire other people to be like, if these guys can do it, I can do it. Like they don't look that special. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dude, I, I, um, um, I need to be put under pressure in order to, uh, you know, take risk or, or act and I think the easiest way I knew to kind of trick myself into that, to really like make a go of, um, you know, a, a, a career in the Bitcoin education space was to, you know, hand in a resignation. Uh, so it was, it was sort of becoming clear that, hey, here's this, here's this new wave um, coming in. If I want to ride it, I, you know, it, you really need to dedicate yourself to it. So yeah, gave in my, uh, my resignation and then just thought I'm going to, you know, give myself a year, 18 months, maybe to really try to make go of this. And I'm, you know, pretty lucky that it worked out. When, when was this that you given, given your resignation? This was about 2016. What did um, your parents say? Uh, they, they always knew that <laughs> I don't really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You go, you go to business school, you, you, uh, and uh, because I was an international student, I, you know, I can get a business loan, so I had to pretty much use up all my savings to do so. Um, so to kind of take a risk like that early on, yeah, it's maybe not not popular, but then it just seemed I was young enough that I could recover from it. So that the window was mm. was there, but if I didn't take it, there wouldn't be another. Right. Yeah. Cool. So, so, so we so said you're like, okay, that's huge by the way. Right. Because like, yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. I remember the day I shift gears too, from my kind of robotics life to Bitcoin. And it was like, Oh, yeah. it was scary a bit, but, um, right. it, yeah. I can't say haven't looked back. Definitely have looked back, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's like, a, it's like surfing or something. I don't surf, but I, I imagine it's something like that. You're just always <laughs> barely on the brink of either yeah. making it or complete disaster. <laughs> but that's, I think that's a great place to <laughs> live. You know? Yeah. Um, so, okay. So, but how do you make a go of it? Yeah. Like, Oh my God. Well, so the next year and a half, I mean, that's like movie material. Yeah. I, I still remember the very first thing I did was, uh, I applied to, I thought, Oh, okay. Um, all my friends are in consulting and banking now. Uh, you know, that's probably the area I should go into. And I was looking at who was hiring. And I remember interviewing with, um, Polychain Capital. Um, it was, you know, headed by Olaf, who was the early I think, chief risk officer at Coinbase, who yep. left and then, you know, started the fund. And the interview went terribly. It was <laughs> an absolute train wreck in that his, uh, it was with, it wasn't with uh, him, it was with, um, oh, who was his partner at the time? I can't remember. But it made it very clear to me that I didn't know my shit. I really needed to uh, step back, do a deep dive, really understand this thing. If I thought I had any shot in hell of, of making my way into this industry in a legitimate way. So that was really a blessing in disguise because it really humbled me early on. And it was, it was hard to watch because, you know, a few months later, here they are on, you know, on the cover of Forbes with a couple of billion under management. Um, but then it, you know, really brought me back to basics and it, you know, really led me like 
okay, it's it's really Bitcoin. That's that's the innovation here. That's the interesting thing happening. Try to ignore all the noise uh, and really focus down. Okay, and then now uh, what do you do? So how how do you tinker from there and find some something? <laughs> yeah, I guess it was a product of uh, putting out content. So maybe going back to you know Twitter mm. being such an interesting distribution mechanism because you can reach such interesting people uh and you know this whole fin twit ecosystem kind of has grown uh in the last few years so it just that's where everyone was so i would kind of put out content that i was interested in or or perhaps you know different analogies of how to explain this and then you know people would reach out like hey do you mind coming to speak to uh this class or um you know, give a talk on this panel or, uh, you know, do some investor education for this person. Uh, and that really was how it started. You know, you kind of put things out there and the, the market will tell you what it wants more of and where there's, where there's demand. And do you so remember, very like, organic. you remember what, like, what, were there a few tweets that you look back to that were like, you're like, yeah, I'm on to something here. Like, you know, I, I think I have <laughs> asymmetric insight here. Like, uh, yeah, curious. yeah. I again, it was really just. Uh, I had a talk with with someone recently, and there I explained what I do, and they're like, "Oh, so you're kind of like a librarian." I thought, "Oh, that's a great way to put it," because I'm just really repackaging other people's um, ideas, you know, with credit, giving them credit, but just trying to explain it in a different way and and trying to keep um, track of all the different ways in which uh, it's been explained. So that depending on the person and where they're coming from and where they're at in their journey, you can kind of pick out, oh, this is what you need right now. You know, this might make the most sense to you at this point in your journey. So that's, that's really what I kind of became. And, and, and most of it was just, hey, what do I wish existed when I started my journey content-wise? What would have been helpful to save me a lot of time and energy or stress or making poor decisions? Uh, so I just kind of created that. Um, and, and, and uh, okay. So, I mean, okay. Wait, was there anything else though on, in terms of your story that you wanted to share before? I mean, it's fascinating by the way, I think uh, yeah. that's crazy that you've like been to so many places and uh, yeah, it seems like, you know, you've, you've like, you've had this like entrepreneurial spirit from like a very long, um, you know, long time. And it's, and it's cool that with Bitcoin, you know, you had this bit of learning process and let life kind of teach you and, and okay, so you resign. Now you're like, okay, people are feeling, you know, the content I'm putting out there. So when did you decide that, okay, I'm going to maybe put this together in the form of a book? Uh, pretty recently. Yeah, I'd say in the last last few months, just the requests kind of piled up and it just, it made sense. It's, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of people coming into this space um, as they do with each kind of consecutive wave. Yeah. And this is kind of the moment where I really want to, help people avoid making uh, mistakes or, um, you know, falling for <clears throat> other scams or uh, FUD, you know, it, it kind of just seemed like it's, this is the time and I, I think the market needs this. And what is it, how, how does the book read in terms of like, is it uh, like, is it so like, yeah, can you kind of explain in the sense that, you know, is it more like an Andreas Antonopoulos hardcore techie? It doesn't sound like, you know, is <laughs> it more all. like, no. you know, conversational? Is it for everyone? Like, can I be, tell my parents to read it? And, and yeah. like, you know, is it more like, <laughs> is it back and forth? I'm curious. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. That's, I think that's the gap I kind of fill in the market. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not, you know, Jack Maul is, I'm, I'm not a highly technical person. I want to be the person who can hold your hand and make you realize that you're not dumb. This is just a fairly complex thing. Mm. And with the right angle, you'll be able to understand it, I promise. So it is absolutely, you know, I think your parents would be able to read this and after it think, I'm not intimidated by Bitcoin as much as I was before. It makes a bit more sense to me what it is, um, what it can be used for, uh, what perspectives are out there, and what misconceptions are out there. 
And what are some of like, I, I, there's, I assume there's like chapters, like what are some of the, I don't know, kind of chapter <laughs> headings? I'm really curious. <laughs> or like, are you able to share uh, some of that? Or like, just, I'm just oh, curious yeah, like, in terms of people want to, um, you know, like, cause, cause there is, I'm not gonna lie. There is a lot of content out there today. Right. There um, yeah. But as again, someone who's been in the space for a while, I'll also agree that a lot of it is very, into, I'm an engineer and I still feel very intimidated by most of the stuff that's out there, you know, and yeah. I've been in the space forever. Well, so, so I love the fact that you're doing this, but uh, I'm curious. Yeah. Like what kind of, you know, what kind of like high level topics do you guys cover? Do you cover in this book? Oh, so I mean, it's, it's pretty much all on my Twitter account, just like threads over the years. I'm just really repackaging the ones that worked or um, had the most uh, traction. Hmm. But yeah, to kind of throw it back at you, I mean, I know you've given hundreds of talks to very wide ranging audiences. Like what are the common threads for you where uh, you're like, this is something that most people are completely missing or, or failing to understand? What is money? Okay, yeah, it always goes back to that. Hey, would you yeah. say? Yeah, yeah, I think that is the fundamental question that, <clears throat> excuse me, that nobody has an answer to, and, um, and I think Bitcoin is the best answer to that question. So, um, yeah, so I'm. I think that if I had to pick one question, like if I had to narrow it down, nobody, nobody knows the question, the answer to the question, what is money, and. And when you ask that question deeply enough, you can quickly start to see what's real and what's not. And um, but yeah, but I would say that that's yeah. the one, that's the probably one thing. Um, I, I recently got in touch with um, do you know Breedlove? Everyone talks, yeah. talks yep. about him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think he has like I saw. Uh, so I'm gonna try and get him on the show soon. Um, but he seems like like this like new kind of woke. Bitcoin chat of sorts, right? Like everyone's like talking about him. He's everywhere. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about getting him on a show. But but I think I, I saw on his like kind of the, the top of his whatever Twitter handle, like what is money? You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. like that is. Yeah, he's it. got the that is the question. Out. You know, that yeah. is the question. So, so yeah, so I would say that. I don't know if that answers your question, but that that's like the it, one it that does. carries the most amount of weight. And I think, and uh, yeah, I think the fact that Bitcoin gets you to ask that question is why Bitcoin is a revolution. Yeah. Do, do you think that question is being asked with more frequency now that, that Bitcoin, you know, A, exists, and then B, everything that's kind of happening in the background? I hope so. I'm trying to do my part in that. Um, but no, no, I use Facebook as a gauge to see where, mm -hmm. like, you know, where people are at, um, not Twitter, because Twitter is super, super like, I just follow guys like you, right? That are just free. right. Yeah, we're all in our ah, bubble. <laughs> the Bitcoin stuff, right? So I, I try and tape, I don't, I hate Facebook and, and like everything about it. But I do like the fact that, you know, it's where my friends, my family, my, you know, my, the people I grew up with, my, tr my tribe or whatever. And in that world, I don't see anybody even right. caring. Like, yeah. I think right now what we're seeing is a bit of an institutional phenomena. And mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think guys or girls and guys that are being paid to really think hard about these problems. Now it's yeah. being magnified. And then like, you know, Michael Saylor, he even said in one of his things that even earlier this year, if you'd asked him what Bitcoin was, he might've just like, you know, not even like mentioned it or he probably wouldn't have even thought of it. But, but yeah. you know, again, the market conditions have forced them down this rabbit hole. So I think, yes, I think current events are definitely helping. Um, yeah, man, but you know, it's not hard. It's not hard. I mean, as a Bitcoin business, you know, one of our investors is, well, recently Tim Draper invested, but Adam mm -hmm. Draper, his son actually invested oh, in boost. Really long ago yeah. and boost. Yeah. And, and yeah. one of their sayings is, you know, be a cockroach. And I, I, I think that's probably the most important thing you could be in Bitcoin is just, <laughs> just stay alive. <laughs> Cause if you stay yeah, alive, like absolutely. long enough, you will, you will, uh, you know, figure things out, have insights, whatever it is. And, and, uh, you know, and then ride the yeah. wave. But, um, but yeah, I would say that's kind of my, 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 what is money? Like that is the one thing that, you know, and uh, that I think that people should ask themselves all the time. They should be Googling it. They should be, you know, asking their friends or family. They should be talking about it. But it's like, it's so, like, it's such an icky topic. Like, if you if people bring it up, like, can you imagine, like, sitting at a dinner table with, like, 10 of your friends and being like, what is money, guys? It's like, everyone thinks yeah. it's so weird. It's yeah. like, that. you don't talk about that. You don't talk about what's in your bank or how oh, much you made. It's I super, super weird. I just want to, like, yeah. you know. Just, I'd like to like play my part in 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 demystifying that, and and then from a first principles build up and be like, yo, 
so what if you could reinvent money <gasps> you know and, right. and someone did yeah. and it's bitcoin <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. And that's i think that kind of plays into the sense of urgency now is for the first time you know the people that you care about have equal access uh to this new money as you know larger institutions that you know typically have a track record of capturing assets uh like this so yeah i think the equal opportunity part is is, is really a big motivator for me of you know the average person can understand this and can kind of figure out what's going on in the background uh, and should be able to protect themselves in some way from future what risk. do you what do you so, mean by that i guess right like i mean i i definitely yeah. can interpret in my head what i would uh interpret that as but what do you mean protect themselves because like most people are like huh like it's like some yeah. risky ass asset like well, what are you talking about protect myself I, I guess just, you know, CPI is BS. <laughs> okay. What's CPI? Uh, Consumer what's, price index? What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, as a, as a, a different, different countries have, uh, you know, or different banks, different central banks in different countries produce a, a measure of inflation based on a basket of goods that they kind of select. Uh, and they select the weighting of that in order to tell you what inflation is or how you're being impacted by how many new units of currency are being introduced into circulation. And there is no incentive for them to give you accurate information or to uh, you know, ever fess up if, if uh, you were being negatively impacted by inflation or uh, you know, irresponsible monetary policy. So I think you know, when you do sit around a table with friends and you're asking what is money, you know, it, it's also a question of asking, well, what's happening uh, to the things your money can buy around you? What's, what is so much more expensive for you now than um, was for your parents and vice versa? You know, what's, what's, what's deflationary that, that you consume? Um, Do you feel like Coca-Cola is somehow like artificially subsidized to hold their price at a dollar to give us all the <laughs> illusion that there is no inflation? Sorry, I just had that. But <laughs> like, how is the yeah. can of Coke still a dollar at yep. every machine? Like <sighs> everything going anyways. But no, okay. But inflation. It's... Okay. I agree with you, man. Okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm interrupting. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Just on the Coca-Cola <laughs> example. I think that's brilliant because do you, do you remember, I mean, I don't know if your, your parents have this shtick, but I, I know, um, a lot of my friends' parents did have this idea that eggs are bad for you because they have cholesterol. Um, and that kind of gets repeated over and over again. And so where I'm going with this is um, there was the, uh, I wanna say it was like the, the head of the treasury when um, Lyndon Johnson was president and inflation was getting out of hand under his watch and the price of eggs was was going up very quickly. And that was like a very clear signal to citizens that there is inflation in our you know, basic foods. So he had his surgeon general issue an order saying there should be a health warning around cholesterol and eggs to decrease demand for them. So <laughs> it's, it's stuff when you read about, uh, you know, things like that, you, you really understand that, yeah, you know what, I'm sure Coca-Cola is getting, um, uh, <laughs> you know, certain tax incentives somewhere to keep the price low enough that consumers don't understand this inflation. I go to Costco. I'm good, but you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. Right? Um, okay. So what, so what's up? What's up? So I guess how does like, okay, so okay, but no, no, no. Actually, no, let's, let's just pause a bit more. Like, let's just talk a little bit about this because I think it's an important one and gets overlooked. And I used to be a financial advisor in like a past lifetime. Right. Yeah. And it, it was always like, I, I don't even think like, I don't think anyone even asks like, what is inflation? How does it come to be? Like, you know, what the heck is it? Uh, and, and if you would ask me, what is like the one thing I would like to give people like a lifeboat for is to like, is inflation. Like, I don't even think Bitcoin's a great way to like, you know, you know, you shouldn't try and get rid of, get out of paying taxes or anything because it's super no, traceable, no. et cetera, et cetera. But I think one thing it does cure us of is inflation. I, I don't like it. And so what is it? Like, yeah. Well, sorry. You so yeah. You spent a lot of time as a financial advisor and in that that industry, uh, and I'm guessing you're pretty heavily credentialed as well. Was looking back now, what is maybe the one or two things that you wish were part of, you know, those curriculums, or what was like maybe overlooked or intentionally overlooked in that whole 
educational um, process? Well, I so I'm an electrical engineer, so that's what I went to university for. But then after engineering, I had this whole thing where I thought life would be fine, but then you know there was always more month than money. I always say that, you know how. You know what I mean? At the end of the month, you're just like, ah, I wish there was a couple less days because yeah. it's like, <laughs> ah, the paycheck is not coming. Yeah. Uh, but it was just like, whether it was like the student loans or taxes and, you know, partying and after everything, there was just like yeah. no money left. And it was like, you know, I grew up, uh, I grew up having asthma as a kid. And so I kind of felt like money was similar in that sense is that it's, uh, it's like, it's like oxygen in that way that when you have it, you're game, you're good. But when yeah. you're having an asthma attack, it's like breathing reading through a straw and someone's like squeezing the end of it. You're just like barely trying to stay alive. Money's kind of the same way as when you learn about money management and you learn about things like that, it does set you free. But I got to admit, I, I, as an engineer going into the financial world, it was really hard for me because morally I felt like things were just like off. Like this just didn't seem right. The incentives were off. Like no one had, like I said, if I were to ask anybody even like, what is money? Um, whereas like a Bitcoiner or someone in Bitcoin can tell you like, oh, you know, fungibility. And there's just like this basic definition. Anybody can look it up on Wikipedia. Yeah. It's just, but nobody even does. Nobody thinks right. to, nobody cares to. Yet, yet everybody loves money. People get into divorces because right. of money. They get into world wars because of money, but nobody just pauses and asks themselves, what is money? Like, where does it come from? So I wish that more people would, you know, educate themselves on, on yeah. the history of money and, and yeah. all of that. But, but sorry, but what was your question? I don't know if I answered it there. Um, oh, just, just, just exactly that. What was maybe overlooked when you were going through that stage of your career? Yeah, again, so what was after all my advisor it? licenses and this and that, yeah. I could sell mutual funds, I could advise yeah. on this and that. But I couldn't, I couldn't explain to people why inflation existed. Yeah. We teach people that, well, there's this thing called the stock market and, you know, on average, it goes 10%. And even that, it was like, well, just because it's done 10% every year, does that mean it's going to continue? Well, you right. know, uh, well, you have a disclaimer in the past, uh, doesn't include, doesn't it? But so yeah. we're yeah. going to, we're going to tell people to like take money out of their houses and then like put it in these like risky assets and just hope for the best. Like, and then, you know, and then you just deep, dig deeper yeah. and deeper. And then you're like, oh, wait, so th these people are just teaching you like little tricks and things of how to pay less taxes. Right. But they're not getting to the core of it. It's like, so inflation is like a hand wavy thing. It's like they teach you, oh, you, you know, you need to beat taxation, you need to beat your inflation. You to, but what are those things? And why do they even exist? And, you know, how come no one bothers to ask? And so it's like those deeper questions that made me eventually just be like, oh, like, I, I don't want to be in this industry at all. I ended up spending almost mm -hmm. eight years in robotics. And then only when okay. I discovered the Bitcoin white paper and I was like traveling, I was on the other side of the world in India and Bangalore. I was like, oh my Lord, like, this is it. Like I missed the internet thing. I missed the mobile thing. I am yeah. not missing this Bitcoin thing. Like no way. Right. <laughs> so you, you could, in your mind, you, you identified it. This is as significant as those. Shifts. Bigger. Yeah. To me, yep. it's, it felt, felt like it was, it was even bigger. Yeah. Yeah. It was because yeah. freedom. And I was also going deep down the, you know, whether it be like Occupy Wall Street, but Ron Paul, uh, who I eventually yeah. ended up getting to meet, which is crazy, yeah. uh, at Satoshi Ooh. Roundtable. I know uh, Bruce yeah. had him. But like, you know, guys like, you know, Ron Paul demystifying like money and like freedom. You know, what does it mean mm -hmm. to be free? You know, like, I don't think you're even taught these things or even question it. Like, um, and so, yeah, so, so all of this eventually led me to, you know, discovering Bitcoin and, and it just fit like my whole worldview in this like magical way. And right. it was only like $50 million market cap or something, but I was telling everybody and lead recently, a friend of mine even shared, you know, uh, with me, like a Facebook message when I was back in the day, like, dude, like, yeah, this no, thing not. is insane. Like you've got to get in and. And, and again, I don't even think price is the crazy thing. I think mm -hmm. I, like I do so many, I do events. Like you've been to my events. I'm doing this. I don't even know what this is. I do, I build businesses. I so maybe someday I'd love to write a book. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll like, uh, you know, write like a little, little synopsis for one of your books or something in the corner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. no, I'm not, but no, I just, I just think it's important that people give whatever they can, right? Do, Their art. Mm -hmm. do, do you think it changes though? Cause you know, going back to maybe having that global perspective uh, and getting to see what money is in different places. And, and you mentioned your, your wife is Colombian, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I really loved going to uh, Colombia because when you land, I don't know if you remember this, uh, in immigration, there's two lines 
or sorry, there's three lines, one for Colombian citizens, one for everyone else, and then one specifically for Canadians, right? Because <laughs> Canada put a visa fee on Colombians. So Colombia turned around and said, well, it's going to be reciprocal. We're going to put the same fee on. It's just going to even it out. Uh, and you could only kind of pay that fee in US dollars. So to me, it's like, okay, they've got their own currency, but they want their immigration department is collecting fees in US dollars. Something's going on here with, you know, not all currencies are the same. Um, so that was a bit of a, a wake up call for me as well. And especially seeing how, you know, the US dollar is maybe treated in different countries as uh, a better money. Um, yeah, it kind of just sends you down the rabbit hole. And I find certain countries intuitively understand or are forced to understand what money is, maybe more so than, than you know, people in, in very uh, comfortable uh, situations might have to. And yeah, I agree with you. And, and, you know, when I was going deep down this rabbit hole, it was actually gold, right? That was the whole thing yeah. that Ron Paul and Peter Schiff and all these guys go off on is yeah. like gold. And again, at the time I was living in India and it was a bit surprising because I'm from Canada. And when I, when I would like, you know, when payday came around in India, for example, you'd see lineups of people. Yeah. Every 10th store in India is a gold store. <laughs> it seems like yeah. it. Yeah. And everybody's lined up, turning their rupees into gold. So seeing that too was like a cultural, like awakening a bit. It's like, wait, like none of my friends in, in Toronto or Edmonton or whatever, they, none of them care about gold. Like if I told them I was going down to that right. funny looking guy, you know, <laughs> the, the, what's that guy's yeah. name? The, I don't even know, but you know, the funny looking guy on the back of the buses and all that, the oh, guy yeah. sell gold. Yeah. It's like, that's what we yeah. think of when we think of gold. But in India, right. you know, and if you're from an Indian family, like mom, we are, it's like, oh, you, you know, gold is like, yeah. it's everything, right? So, so, but it was really just, I remember when one day I was calling my wife and I was like, okay, there's this Bitcoin thing. And I was really going down the silver uh, rabbit hole. I was like, there's a okay. silver thing. And it was really like when I started playing with both of them, I started realizing that, you know, silver and gold, just the fact that you can't move it made it kind of like good, but super obsolete because you couldn't zap it across the world. And that, that was really my like awakening. I was like, whoa, like this, not only is it the best money, it's like, I can literally yeah. send it to anybody at any point, like without anyone's permission. It's like, yeah, it's so beautiful. Um, so yeah. So, so to me, it was like a lot of those kind of factors, you know, coming into play. It's like understanding the, the love for gold, understanding how hard it was to move money and mm. also just waking up mm. to the fact that like it's just pieces of paper, it's literally pieces of paper right. that have like dudes faces on it from like a long time ago, you know, <laughs> you know, or like a lady or whatever. It's like, and we all buy into it. It's like that, that's money. And it is because yeah. until something better is, you know, so. Right. But that's, that's the key point though, <laughs> until something better is. And a lot of people maybe don't know that money changes over time it has been different things in the past it will continue to be different things in the future it isn't this like static thing of pieces of paper with some dead dude's picture on it uh, i think exactly. if you get that point across then people really like their interest peaks yeah and then if you're ever trying to sending a wire or something i mean it's like every interaction like with yeah. the monetary system with the financial yeah. world just feels more and more kind of cumbersome and and difficult yeah. whereas you know with bitcoin it just gets uh, better and easier and faster um did all your please please hey by the way you can go here. all day if you want i love asking oh, questions man. i just uh yeah <laughs> because of the, please <laughs> uh, your experience yeah in india dealing with like regulatory please, bodies yeah. and banks Sure. Did all that frustration, um, like, it obviously didn't weigh you down because you're you're here today, but did like understanding more about the the pipes of the financial system like strengthen your resolve in Bitcoin? Like, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, but I also almost lost hope in Bitcoin. I'm not gonna lie. Like, okay. I think even one year ago today yeah for sure one year because we won the court case in march so one year ago today mm -hmm. i think i was the head of business development at kraken i'd already quit mm -hmm. the company i'd started uh because like what future was there we were literally up against the central bank of like one of the most populous countries in the world 
where we knew that they didn't want us to be, you know what I mean? Like uh, doing what we were doing. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I lost, I almost lost hope. Um, uh, but it was guys like Jesse that were just like, yo, come on board, like help us. Like, you know, Bitcoin's still a thing that, that kept me still in Bitcoin. Um, and you know, like I, I've shared this story before, but like I, I we, we, we in 20. 13, December 2013, uh, we did a big conference in Bangalore <clears throat> called the Global Bitcoin Conference. I even had the domain. I don't even think we have it anymore. Global okay. Bitcoin Conference. That, that's how <gasps> audacious we were. We were just like, yo, Satoshi's going to step from the project. We are all Satoshi, right? So we're like, Global Bitcoin Conference, bring it. And it wasn't my idea for the record. Oh, sorry about that. It wasn't my idea, but a couple of the other guys decided that they were going to invite, you know, the central bank. Uh, they were going to invite, you know, uh, the RBI and then all the other regulators uh, to our event where we actually launched UnoCoin. And, uh, and, you know, and lo and behold, they showed up. And, uh, you know, the conference was starting up at a five-star hotel in Sheraton, Bangalore. And I get a tap on my shoulder and someone's like, Sunny, someone wants to talk to you. Um, they're from the RBI. I said, oh, excellent. Great. Like, I mean, my approach is like, yo, this is the future of money. Yeah. Like everyone's going to know yeah. about it. Everyone's going to have to deal with it. Right. So yeah. I'll talk to anybody any day about Bitcoin. Right. And so I went up to him and he's like, are you one of the organizers? I was like, I like the way he asked me, I was just like, uh, yes, sir. Uh, and then he was just like, look, if anyone even like calls us out or says that we're here, I'm just going to simply stand up and, and leave. Mm. And, you know, and he made it very clear that, look, I'm just here to kind of listen and take notes and, and I'm not here to do anything else. I'm not here to like, you know, participate in any way. So I was like, enjoy the samosas. <laughs> 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 Famous last words. No, no, I'm kidding. No. And then like literally two weeks after that, there was a notice on the RBI's website saying, you know, we think Bitcoins are risky. They are um, volatile. We have concerns around their security. And, you know, to that, I say that the free market is there to help address those problems, right? Um, you know, what gave me faith, though, a lot in terms of in India was, have you ever heard of Raghuram Rajan? I mean, a gentleman by the yeah. name of, so he, he, I mean, people don't know about this guy, but he's like, he's crazy, right? He's like an electrical engineer. He was what, something, something for the IMF. He wrote a book on like the financial crisis and it was like super correct. I have it on my shelf. It's like. The guy um, was ended up becoming the governor, the governor of the central bank in India. And when we started Unicoin, he was that for many years. And on one of the, it's still available on YouTube. Um, what one interviewer asked him, or one kid in the audience asked him, "Sir, you know, what's your thought on Bitcoin?" And he said, "Look, like something like this will be the form of money, or you know, will be the predominant." way of that people transact in the future and you know we shouldn't be against it and and yes other you know parts of the rbi eventually did and you know whatever whatever and but yeah it's but i but i'd answer your question i would say it's definitely um strengthened my belief in bitcoin like i i don't consider you know like i i keep enough funds in my bank account to pay my bills for three to six months and and i i try and huddle and when the bitcoin price drops like it did today i go yay i can like earn more or i can buy more and i get excited and so it's kind of warped and uh yeah but but to me bitcoin represents freedom our financial goals within our family aren't like oh how many X millions of dollars do you want to get to when you're this age? It's more like how many Bitcoins, <clears throat> you know, do we want to get to? Right. Because that makes us work harder because it's harder to earn Bitcoins over time. And, you know, if your goals are just in financial terms, you'll break them in six months. <laughs> So, yeah, for us, we've had a big paradigm shift. My wife now works in the Bitcoin space. You know, my kids are like all gung ho. And uh, yeah, well, that's what's interesting to me as well is how my, my mother in laws worried, actually. She's just like, oh, my okay. God, you guys are brainwashing your kids. Like, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> they should know what real money is. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Sorry. I interrupted. Go on. <laughs> no, but they're all like, yeah, legitimate things we hear. She works for the bank. Just yeah. Come in, yeah. Things yeah. you hear all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I think it makes kids, it makes intuitive sense to them that every unit of this is, uh, you know, I can verify that I have it. It's part of a, a fixed supply. I know what percentage of, of the total supply I own. I can send it to anyone I want anywhere in the world. You know, it just, it, it's so obvious to them that I just think that, you know, especially Generation Z, their base unit of account 
is not going to be fiat. Uh, it just it won't connect with them. The way they interact with technology, it just yeah. There, there's definitely not to like generalize across generations, but um, it just seems so obvious. Especially like you said, when you travel so much, Anil, right? Like, where are you going to keep all your wealth? You're going to keep it in this country's bank account with that, with all these people that are just like, yeah. you know, like where every chance they get, like, even if you try and spend a credit right. card, if you're from Canada and you go to credit, you try your credit card in India, you'll have to like stay on the phone for 45 minutes just to make a $10 transaction. Like, yeah. Um, anyways, it's like, it's just like, it's just so obvious that it's funny. Um, but yeah, but no, I don't feel that we're even close to any sort of like mass adoption. I think we're super early. I, I don't know, man, I, I feel like we're all still kind of drinking our own Kool-Aid, but you know, but, but, sure, but, yeah. but it's changing, it's changing, it's changing. Um, Hey, well, I have one more. I know you said you had a, you were going to give me an extra 15 minutes, right? So, so sure, are we still yeah, good for a little yeah. bit? Okay. Totally. What is one thing that you believe to be true that others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Oh, this is not very exciting or um, very original, but it's really that just always going back to the fact that Bitcoin is a tool. It doesn't have opinions. It doesn't care what you think. It's just code and it's going to do what it's been programmed to do. Uh, I mean, seeing it more like uh, Andreas Antonopoulos has a really good talk and a couple of um, written pieces around, you know, dumb networks and that they, you know, they don't care what's being transacted or communicated. It's just they're going to, you know, <laughs> blocks are going to get packaged and disseminated across the network. Um, so I would just say, I just think it's less important to pay attention or spend your energy um, worrying too much about people's opinions of what this is or should be. And it's just going to be what the market decides over time. Um, it's going to function as designed. So yeah, I mean, that kind of goes to your philosophy of like, you know, price is the least interesting thing about this. Uh, so I, I would just really advocate for people to, yeah focus less on opinions more in understanding the mechanics of this um and accept that it's kind of just going to keep you know producing blocks roughly every 10 minutes um without interruption nice uh okay i love it hey just a couple of uh maybe slightly tangential questions just to round us our interview i, I was going to ask you do you think much about ai um, is that like a topic that comes across your radar or do you want to maybe just pass on this question? Um, but yeah, I'm just curious, I, is that a topic <laughs> that, uh, that, that even comes across your radar? Sonny, I'm not smart enough to be talking to talking about, about AI. AI. <laughs> I love, I love, I love AI stuff, man. I'm kind of, I, I just got access to open AI, by the way, you'd oh, be surprised. Cool. Okay. You'd be surprised yeah. how it's actually for guys like you and me, <clears throat> meaning okay. it's actually like the way I interact with open AI, yeah. natural language. That means that's a fancy way of saying English. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I just tell it the, like a friend <laughs> what I want to do. <laughs> it's crazy. Someone um, showed me some samples of copy that uh, had been written using OpenAI. And I think it, it must have been a, in a, a, they sent me a link to a tweet. And all the replies to this tweet were copywriters saying, oh, shit <laughs> they like well, i'm gonna be out of a job very soon this is incredible like it's the amount insane. of nuance that was captured it's yeah insane uh there is there's a website uh actually i won't even mention this website it's so good i'll tell you after we finish this uh <laughs> this interview because it's like it's like stupid yeah. like cool it's amazing okay ai pass on that one ubi is that is that a topic you might have you had any thoughts around um like this idea of and again i don't even like yeah. government-led universal mm -hmm. basic income programs but yeah, let's let's yeah. just speak to like the the general issue which is like obviously now i don't even talk about ai like job losses everywhere and things like yeah. Ubi are already showing up, whether we like it or not. Guys like Elon Musk are talking about it. Any thought on that? Uh, you, you know, can, can Bitcoin maybe, I don't know, play a part, you think? Or I don't know. You know what's sad, Sonny, is when you said Ubi, uh, as a new dad, the first thing that came to mind is uh, Ubi is a brand of diaper like pails. <laughs> That you, <laughs> yeah that you put dirty divers in so that was I'm like one. why is he talking about yeah, oh yeah, do yeah. you yeah 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 um 
but yeah, in, in, in terms of universal, universal basic income, I guess it just always goes back to where is this money coming from? And if it's being printed, in which most cases I believe it would be, uh, it's really just the tax on every dollar that's held by someone in a savings account. Um, but then the sad part is, you know, throughout history, we've, we might not have had fiat money for very long, but we've always had citizens that would overthrow uh, governments or emperors or rulers in favor of redistributing wealth. Um, so I imagine, you know, it's going to be very politically popular. Uh, and I, I think, well, I mean, we already are heading in that direction, but I don't imagine the masses not voting for free money. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a guy named, oh, I gotta stop talking about him. I talk about him all the time, but Yanni, you know, you know, have you ever heard of eToro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a guy named Yanni. He 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 pretty, he's yeah. working on a project called Good Dollar, which I think a lot about, and it's interesting. But it's it's built on the Ethereum network. Um, mm. but it's uh, it's essentially like a, a free market approach towards Ubi, and I don't know. Again, yeah. like I, I, um, and you know, I always say too is is the actually sorry, Max Kaiser recently said that you know Ubi is a, a, a like kind of a a broke idea, a more woke idea is universal Bitcoin millionaires. <laughs> let's yeah. make everybody you know well, a bitcoin millionaire somehow i don't well, know <laughs> let me ask you this especially i mean i know the u.s a lot of the inflation kind of gets passed around or or passed off overseas to to you know uh everyone or else around the world who owns u.s dollars but if they cut you know six hundred dollar two thousand dollar checks say consistently on a monthly basis where do you think inflation will show up first what, what do you think we'll see like, you know, price rises in that would maybe shock people into thinking, oh, you know, where, <laughs> how did this happen? Why, uh, you know, uh, limited edition Air Jordans suddenly on eBay for 30 grand? Yeah, I, yeah, that's a good question. So what would it take uh, for people to wake up to that? I don't know. I don't know. I always... I already kind of think it's happening because uh, you know how people always price Bitcoin in terms of USD and they show this like crazy meteoric rise. I like doing the opposite of that. I like posting the US dollar price against Bitcoin. And it reminds me of what's actually <laughs> happening to my, to the dollar. Like it's not right. a matter of, you know, the US dollar losing its value to Coca-Cola or Apple. It's, it's the measuring stick, which is yeah. Bitcoin. Can I buy more app? When I learned about it, it was whatever, five or 10 bucks. Today it's 40 or 50 grand or whatever Canadian. Can I buy more apples with 40 or 50 grand than $10? I think so. I think so. Yeah. I'm not that great at math, but it's like, like you know, and people like people come up with all these sophisticated reasons as to why a deflationary right. currency is bad uh, and how they have it all figured out. It's like, you don't want more apples? Like what, dude? Right. Like, yeah. are you crazy? Like, like <laughs> anyways, um, man, I'm just having fun with it now. I've been in this space for long enough where I was, yeah. like I said, I was ready to like throw in the towel, man, more than enough times. And and if it wasn't for my co-founders at Unicoin and all the other things like pay case and stuff, I'd probably be not, wouldn't be doing this, but I am. Yeah, man. And so I'm just kind of going down this path, having fun. Any other questions yeah. for me, Neil? I don't want to like brush you um, off. I mean, I love answering questions, but I also know you yeah. have a bit of a hard stop too. Yeah. Uh, I guess it maybe you really just touched on it. And I thought that's kind of what uh, I think is like the most effective thing to be doing if you are in like the Bitcoin education space is helping people change their measuring stick, like swap out the, your measuring stick um, yeah. for Bitcoin, because it really does change how you see the world. You know, you really do have to look at things very differently, uh, especially in terms of opportunity cost. A friend of mine recently said, he's like, how do you hire somebody in this Bitcoin space if, if, if you know they're gonna make so much money probably like in comparison to dollar terms that they're not going to want to stay and it's like well the secret is get them to measure their wealth in bitcoin let's see how rich they think they are then you know and yeah. um yeah it definitely gets you to reevaluate you know like just like little myths like oh you have to buy real estate you don't have to buy real estate mm -hmm. 
you can have, you can live in a house and rent and, and you know and put everything else in bitcoin like if you i mean you don't have to but i'm just saying like you, you can think about it my my favorite thing to do because i'm not a trader and i find market timing is like equivalent to trying to you know predict the position of an atom in a glass of water it's like impossible um my favorite thing to do is is just to advocate for dollar cost averaging into bitcoin so every month you divorce yourself from the price you don't care about it you just have the overall thesis that yes it's going to be higher 10 years 20 years from now and you just uh you just buy in you know a little bit one percent to five percent of whatever your monthly thing is if you're more hardcore more than that but um i feel that that's the most like widely applicable because i'm not going to ask people everyone to build on top of bitcoin right most people are going to just live their life but I, I do think that is i don't know i think it's like a great way to Let's not say call it rich, get get rich quick. It's like the don't get poor as, as the Bitcoiners yeah. like to say. <laughs> don't get poor slowly yeah. plan. Slowly. Yeah. <laughs> man, I've been really enjoying oh. this, Anil. Maybe a little bit too much, buddy. But what, what else you got from me, man? Like, do you have, if you have oh. any questions, I'm down to take those. Um, if yeah. not, I, you're, uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. You know what, last, last question. Just because yeah, you're please. very uniquely positioned to answer this, maybe more than anyone else in the space is, how do things play out in India, specifically regarding Bitcoin in the future? Like, and what that's I a very will say to that, yeah, question. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's a good question. Um, I think that depends. I think that depends on on the people listening to this, on people, other entrepreneurs. You know, I know one thing that I was a bit disappointed by is that when, you know, for the lack of a better phrase, when shit hit the fan in India almost every other company split every other company, all the, like, I'm not even Indian. I'm just like, I, I'm just, I'm Canadian. I, I'm, I'm, I have my, my, oh, what is it OCI? called? OCI, yeah. CI, or OCI <laughs> yeah. or whatever. But, um, but yeah, but a lot of the people there, you know, not Satvik and Harish, not the guys behind Unicoin, but a lot of them split. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm doing these kind of uh, whatever the hell this is, this podcast, or whatever, is one of my kind of side goals is to encourage not to like come down on the people that didn't, but to let people know that you, that that, you know, that you should that you should stand up like this. So, so I guess my answer to your question is that I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's a function of what people do like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like I said, like bad things, it'll probably get worse before it gets better. I don't think, I think people who think that, oh, India's, you know, you hear a lot of like foreign kind of companies now coming in and trying to make moves in India. I, I welcome that obviously, but it's like, don't just sit on the sidelines. Like I've, for example, interviewed Nishit Desai, who is mm. the main man, the like the lawyer, the law firm that literally fought this. They were on our cap table from 2014. And, uh, you know, if you listen to Nishit's interview that I did of his, he talks about how it's like foreign companies now, like, okay, you want into India, but like, we need to have like, you know, some sort of collaboration. We need to be working together um, to address these challenges, you know, whatever it may be. And I think India has a long way to go still, but this was a big one, man. This one, I, I think, um, I, I don't think you'll see something like this happen in the near term because there was a, a precedent set, um, you know, and, but I, I'm a bit biased, Anil, but I think that I feel that 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 this story is like a really big one in India, and and the whole idea of what happened with Unocoin, and I don't know if you know about like the false arrests of my co-founders and all this stuff, but like these guys have been you know kind of like dragged through the gutter, and they're still fighting, and we're also fighting, and and so um, yeah, so definitely we definitely believe more in this. You know, I did ask Satvik once. I was like Satvik, like. Yeah, actually, no, I, I'll say this maybe. I'll say this story for another time, dude, because I'm like trampling on your uh, your 15, 20 minute <laughs> extension. But hey, dude, I was going to say, if you want to do another one where you, you know, grill me on anything, I'm an uh, open book. Yeah. I would be down. You can share it if you want or just use it for however you want. But I'd be, I'm game, man, um, any day. And I do have stories to tell. And, and you know, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I just think it's, yeah, I, I absolutely will take you up on that in the future because I think yours is a really important story to tell to kind of show here is here is the path you had to kind of navigate in order to, you know, kind of fight for legitimacy uh, against a fairly, you know, uh, not, not very friendly um, central bank and government. Yeah, yeah. And that's 100%. probably going to be replicated in many other countries in the, in the coming decade.
So. 100%. 100%. I do think, I think what would be a win to some extent would be if central banks, maybe the RBI chooses to put Bitcoin on its balance sheet. <laughs> maybe a long shot still, but but I mean, the CBDC yeah. stuff, seriously, come on. Come on, come on, come on. I know, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no yeah. I'm just kidding. I mean, I, I, yeah, it is what well. it is. It's great. No, I think it's bringing innovation to fiat, blah, blah, blah. But come on, like, come on. The first major central bank to, to be like, hey, we're going to allocate 1%. 0.1%, 0.00001% of our balance sheet to Bitcoin. I think that'll be, I think it's already happening actually. Somebody told me that Iran and I think Venezuela and these countries yeah. are doing it. So it's maybe happening at the edges. Well, but. yeah. And a lot of, you know, there are a handful of governments out there who, you know, own Bitcoin just through asset seizures as the proceeds of crime. And, you know, you see the value of that go up. Uh, that's going to wake you up. Maybe to, they can use that on. for their Ubi program. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> see, I thought about that. Now we're getting somewhere, yeah. <laughs> right, uh, right, airdrop Bitcoin to all your, airdrop all your confiscated all Bitcoin your to all your people. There you go. That Boom, we just solved the global problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I, I do think about this stuff. And I, and I do, I do yeah. think that, you know, in the age of code and ones and zeros and yeah. IT and blah, blah, blah. I, I, we, we should be able to solve some of these problems. And you don't, you only need to get five or 10 bucks in the hands of most people. Um, to enable them to survive. I'm not talking about like, oh, well, what about the people that are gonna get lazy if you just get, dude, like five bucks, five bucks, five bucks, come on. We could we get all spare a couple bucks, um, but not just spare, right? Like what if you could like, like, you know, social, what is it called? Muhammad Yunus talks about this idea of like a social, social business, yeah. social credit, social mm -hmm. business, which is like, you build a system or an ecosystem that's not necessarily profit driven. Anyways, it has like social yeah. concerns and like, but what if you could solve social problems without, guns is my question without like governments without what if you could solve it through innovation like ones and zeros hardware software like that's what that's what i think the next five ten years of my life was going to be looking like is like figuring or trying to figure out you know how to make the whole world uh what is it called what is it uh universal basic millionaire like max kaiser says i like that one <laughs> you know okay dude where do people find out about you uh website yeah. twitter all that kind of stuff pretty much uh exclusively on twitter uh, at Anil said so. Uh, I don't work for any company. Uh, I'm purely an independent educator, um, which I think is is good because then you know I'm accountable. <laughs> it's no one else. Uh, it, it, it's just me. Um, yeah, find me on 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 Twitter, and uh, yeah, I'll have a book out in a in a few months. Um, yeah amazing amazing man okay like i said um if you want to come back on you know anytime talk about current events my story your story other stories yeah. whatever man i'm game uh okay so with that said and you'll hang around for a little bit was there anything else you wanted to share or are we good i think, I think we're yeah. good okay cool i'm gonna bring this one to an end yeah.